After the Battle of Imbabo, Medalik got imperial consent to march his armies into the various lands farther south of the Ethiopian Empire. To be effective in this, he needed to strengthen his state and military, things he did by deepening ties with two newcomers to the Horn of Africa, Italy and France. Both of these European powers had entered the Horn around the early 1880s, France through the purchased port of Obok and Italy through the Asab Bay. The arrival of these new empires not only brought settlers and the new set of gun-selling merchants to Africa's horn, but also European politics, politics that would quickly start to clash with Ethiopia's interests. See, the British and French empires were in a bit of a competition to see who could grab more land in Africa. Given this, the British Empire had aims to cut off the French from their new foothold of territories in modern Djibouti, and this especially meant keeping the valuable port of Massawa out of their control, a task they didn't think the currently governing Egyptians were up to. Skipping over the interests of Emperor Johannes, Italy was decided to be the new owner of Massawa. Now, naturally, this move didn't please Johannes, but while he was no doubt upset, if Menelik shared that anger, he didn't show it to Italy. The desire for European guns made maintaining good relations with the Italians important for the Negus, and the Italians, who wanted a powerful Ethiopian ally to turn against Johannes, were eager to supply this king with the guns he so needed. Trade agreements between the two parties guaranteed Shawa hundreds of thousands of cartridges and tens of thousands of Italian imported guns, while French traders sold lower quality guns at vastly inflated prices on a more local scale. Given these new partners, the Kingdom of Shawa managed to import tens of thousands of guns of all kinds between 1878 and 1887. The Emperor was nowhere near as fortunate. While Shawa maintained good relations with Italy, an 1887 battle between Rasalula and Lt. Col. Christophorus ensured that both critical gun trade through Misawa would be blocked and that imperial relations with the Italians would not be cordial. The Agar Magnet is a term used by some to refer to Metalik's expansions. It can be roughly translated as a sort of cultivation of land but to many academics, it has a deeper ideology than mere expansion, an ideology steeped in controversy. Whether or not you see the term as referring to an epic expansion that would restore Ethiopia's medieval and ancient glory, or instead to the campaign of a brutal black colonist who oppressed and killed those whom he conquered, it is undeniable that these campaigns were essential in shaping the modern country of Ethiopia, and thus the politics of an entire region of the world. Now, depending on who you ask, this Agar Meknet began at different points in time, and it can be argued that Ethiopian southern expansion began prior to the Battle of Imbabo, when Gojam was still viably expanding south. But Medalik won Imbabo, not Tekla Hemenot, and so it would be his kingdom, Shawa, that would become the sort of empire under an empire. Prior to Imbabo, Medalik had launched some invasions with varying success, but by the end of 1886, he had taken Goma, Walaga, Jima, and the other Gaib states into his control. Those like Jima that accepted Shawa negotiation before significant conflict would see favorable treatment, but those that Menelik had to forcefully invade would see what was common in conquest, a destroyed nobility, reallocations of land, and the reallocation of many people to a social and societal group known as the Gaber. What exactly a Gaber was and what it's most comparable to is, of course, controversial and they have been compared to peasants, serfs, servants, laborers, and slaves. I won't take a stance on this. Given this, it can be understood why many submitted to the Shawan Nagus, but many still resisted, among the most fierce being the Arsi Oromo. Arsi resistance began as early as 1882, when following a Shawan campaign to their land, the locals elected two representatives to accompany King Menelik back to the Antoto capital. Here, Menelik proposed his standard submission in exchange for relative preservation. Though pressured, the representatives returned to RC country, held council, and decided to resist further incursion, of which there would be more than one. After his 1886 Goma and Walaga campaigns, Medalik and his uncle, Ras Darzes Adlisilasi, left with the goal of annexing the Arsi, who had formed three main coalitions to resist the Shawans. 
On campaign, Metalik's army suffered a notable defeat, courtesy of RC cavalry. The Shawan army persisted, though the King Metalik himself eventually departed to return to his capital, suffering from an ambush before arriving. Ras Darje was now left with an army in hostile land. The rain season was about to set in, and so as a result, any active campaign would prove difficult. The general instead decided on a defensive strategy. He ordered three rings of defenses to be built around his camp, and planned a trick. Using some RC informants, Darje convinced the enemy commanders to attack his fort. He then ordered for the construction of trenches to surround his camp. His plan was to use the attack information garnered from his informants to prepare a trap for the spear-wielding RC. When they charged down his fortifications, they, stuck within the walls of Darja's defenses, would be mowed down by his gunmen. On September 6th, Darja's plan was put into action. While the details of the battle are a bit inconsistent, what is agreed on is that the RC charged Darja's fort, many of their cavalry falling into his trenches. The significant amount that still pushed in got somewhere around the second wall, where Darje had placed his gunmen. Either impatient, scared, or some combination, they opened fire too early, allowing many RC to escape. But results were nonetheless catastrophic for the attackers. Many of those inside the fort were mowed down, costing the RC army anywhere from 6 to 12,000 men. Azula did not, however, mark the end of the Shawan invasion of RC territories. It would take four months for RC lands to be fully incorporated, and years until a second four-year-long campaign was completed to annex the southern Baird lands. Regardless, with the RC now subdued, the door was opened for Metalik to pursue a new conquest, the annexation of the famed city of Herer. Hey guys, so this video was part of Project Africa, a collaboration between multiple different history YouTubers to try to present different African histories. If you guys want to check out the previous video by Jack Rackham on the life and times of Metalik II, or the next video in the playlist by Step Back History on the brief history of South Africa, make sure to check out the playlist linked in the description or their channel in the pinned comment. Also, if you guys are interested in more Ethiopia content, make sure to check out my channel and to check out the videos by Jack Rackham, Quill Ending History, and Casual Historian. With that, I'll see you in the next one.